Okay, so um, it's uh, 8.30 in India and 4 o'clock in the afternoon in Germany and 10 a.m. Eastern time in uh, USA, 7 a.m. Pacific time, so we run around the clock. Um, so I want to introduce the seminar series and objectives. So critical transitions in complex system, seminar series is being, or CTCS, seminar series is being jointly hosted by IIT Madras, India and Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact of Germany. This seminar series brings together experts from the fields such as climate science, combustion, neuroscience, fluid mechanics, etc., and aims to disseminate the state of the art in the prediction of critical transitions in this diverse field. Uh, we hold this uh, last uh, every month on the last Monday, um, and it's typically around this time, uh, so that we can cover the globe. Before I introduce the speaker, a few housekeeping notes. I request everyone to uh, turn off their microphones and please use the Q&A box in Zoom to ask the speaker your questions. Uh, we'll have ample time at the end to discuss your questions and clarify you. Now, let me get straight to the matter. I'll introduce the speaker yeah. who doesn't need an introduction actually, but I will still do it. Uh, Dr. Ram Ramaswamy uh, is currently a visiting professor in the Department of Chemistry at IIT Delhi. He retired from the Jawaharlal Nehru University where he taught for 32 years in the School of Physical Sciences and in the School of Computational and Integrative Science. Over the years, uh, Dr. Ram Swami's research interests have been in aspects of theoretical chemistry, statistical physics, molecular dynamics, and computational and systems biology. He is a member of the uh, World Academy of Sciences, uh, the Indian National Science Academy in New Delhi, and the Indian Academy of Sciences Bangalore. He was actually the former president from 2016 to 2018. He's the author of over 200 peer review publications and has edited about 30 books and conference proceedings. Today, uh, um, Dr. Ramaswamy, or Ram as he's affectionately called, will speak about generalized synchrony, generalized synchrony as constraint dynamics. So the floor is all yours. I'll stop uh, sharing this and then you can get on. So, Stop sharing, yeah. Okay. I think you are on- Thank you very much, Sujit and uh, Jurgen in absentia uh, for this kind invitation to participate in your seminar series. Um, what I'd like to do is to start sharing um, my screen. Uh, once I get the screen that I want up here. Just a second. It's not coming. Yeah, I know. Uh, after after testing it all, uh, Sujit. The screen button. Yeah, no, no, I've got it. Ah, no. Okay, fantastic. All right. Okay, so uh, today I'd like to talk about, uh, the, the title of my talk is uh, Generalized Synchrony as Constrained Dynamics. And what I basically like to do is to try to explain how we think about the process of synchronization as a method of imposing constraints on a system. Now, uh, as this community knows rather well, and, uh, and we have studied in great detail, uh, the um, you know, synchronous uh, dynamics, synchrony, is among the most common forms of collective behavior that we see in nature. Um, there, are, uh, there are synchronous activities that take place. Uh, thanks to external forcing from the sun, there are circadian rhythms that all organisms on this planet follow. There is motion that is uh, that has special types of synchrony, uh, which keeps uh, planets in flow and so on. So this is actually, if we look about it, this is the, the among the most common forms of collective behavior that we see. And uh, it has a history, and this is uh, the very famous book 
uh, where Jurgen is one of the uh, authors by Pikovsky, Rosenblum, and uh, and Kurtz, uh, which uh, has you know brought so many of these uh, things into the common uh, common studies in the sciences. Um, as is very well known in the community, uh, one of the first people to talk or the first person to explicitly talk about synchronization uh, was Christian Huygens in the 1600s. Uh, and it was an observation that he made uh, in, you know, the, he was secluded and he saw these pendulums that were uh, the pendulum clocks actually, that were suspended from a common beam. And he noticed that uh, when they were set in motion, regardless of how they were set in motion, after a while, they started, uh, they started oscillating in sympathy or together. He described the mechanism, identified the mechanism, uh, I mean, described this phenomenon, and he realized that it was the coupling between the two pendulums that gave uh, the, gave the motion this similarity or sympathy. And the sympathy was expressed as pendulums either oscillating in phase uh, so that their angles were identical or uh, they were anti-phase or the angles were exactly uh, 180 degrees or pi apart. So we call this kind of synchronization in or anti-phase synchrony. Now, you can do this experiment uh, a, you know, a few centuries later, uh, not with pendulums themselves, but with metronomes. And you can see these metronomes are on a common uh, platform. And the platform itself, as you can see, is actually oscillating uh, slightly, ever so slightly, transferring force from one to the other. And uh, I am told by Sujit that you can't actually hear this, uh, the audio of this, uh, of this little clip. But you can see now that after a little while, all the pendulums are now moving exactly in phase. There are many kinds of synchronization that are known now. This is a subject that has developed a, a sort of very, very rapidly in the last few decades. And the kinds of synchronization that are known in biology include, uh, as I already mentioned, circadian rhythms. Uh, we have, uh, you know, because of the fact that we uh, our day is 24 hours, um, a lot of organisms which require energy from the sun have to tune themselves to that rhythm. Uh, a lot of memory uh, is uh, affected in our brains by the synchronous spiking of neurons. And uh, it's a common phenomenon that one notices that when you have large groups of people, it is easier or it is more... Uh, well, the collective behavior is that people will do certain things together like clapping or walking and so on. So this kind of synchronization, there are many forms of synchrony that are well known now, uh, is actually very common. Uh, another important idea that was, or an example of synchrony that was uh, brought to light, so to speak, uh, was the synchronous fireflies of Southeast Asia. Um, I, I, you know, many of the practitioners of the field have heard uh, people like Steve Strogatz and others talk about this. These are spectacular displays of synchronous, synchronous flashing. Uh, and this gave rise, among others, uh, to things like the Kuramoto model, which have been so influential in our understanding of uh, synchrony. Uh, what I would like to also suggest uh, and uh, is that there are other kinds of collective motion that are useful to think about also as synchronization. Uh, here's a picture of fish that are you know, in a coral reef, they're moving around, but ever so often they form schools and one can see these large schools of you know, up to a million fish maybe moving together and uh, this kind of motion, which is highly correlated, uh, is, in a, is a kind of synchrony. Here is uh, another well-known collective motion, uh, the flight of large flocks of birds. This is called a murmuration. Uh, 
And in these murmurations, you can have again a million birds or so, or at least a large number. And these all fly, if not exactly uh, together, there is a kind of synchrony and I, I will try to cover some of that later in the talk. Uh, here is a, a depiction on the right hand side is a depiction by an artist uh, of this murmuration and one can see that you know visually at least there is a certain pattern that uh, this uh, flock takes uh, which are, is very suggestive of a kind of spatial synchronization. Now observations like this suggest many questions and I will touch only the tip of the iceberg uh, and you know, Huygens talked about weekly coupled systems that were just communicating on a on a common beam. Uh, one would like to know what about strongly coupled systems? Do they synchronize? The pendulums that uh, Huygens talked about were almost linear. Uh, so the question is, can nonlinear systems synchronize? Uh, and because we now know that uh, nonlinear systems have a periodic dynamics. Uh, what happens? Do these synchronize? What is the role of noise? How does it help? Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. There are many, many questions, most of which have been answered many times over. All right. So uh, to localize discussion, uh, we'll consider the Lorenz uh, system. This is a well-known chaotic uh, oscillator uh, with uh, three variables in x, y, and z. Uh, with uh, there are a canonical set of parameters, uh, sigma is taken as 10, uh, rho is 28, and beta is 8 by 3. And the typical motion for any initial condition eventually settles onto something that looks like this. Uh, the x variable is a function of time, oscillates back and forth, uh, positive to negative but it takes many circuits in the positive direction, many others in the negative, and it's an unpredictable uh, orbit uh, in the sense that one never quite knows uh, how it's going to oscillate up or down. So given that you have this chaotic uh, behavior, it would be, uh, you know, it, one might think that it is difficult to synchronize such a system, but, uh, it actually turns out that because that this is not so difficult at all. And, uh, you know, Lorenz equations were written in 63 and 20 years later, uh, Fujisaka and Yamada and later on Pekora and Carroll showed that chaotic systems could be made to synchronize via a, a simple master slave kind of coupling where one system drives the other similar system. So if you take two Lorenz oscillators, uh, on the left-hand side, you have the master. Uh, so you've got X, Y, and Z uh, evolving as I've just discussed. And on the right-hand side, you have the slave. And the feature of the slave is that it derives its control, its, its commands from the master. So instead of having uh, all primed variables on the right-hand side of the slave equation, you find that uh, there is only uh, that x from the master feeds into the uh, feeds into the second of these equations. The y dot prime goes as x and not x prime, and and, and the z dot prime also depends on x and not on x prime. So the the slave system gets its uh, instructions, so to speak from the master. And uh, it turns out that once you do that, once you give this form of coupling, and that was done at time 10 uh, in this graph, uh, the master uh, was the uh, purple, is the purple graph of X versus time. And uh, the slave, uh, which is the green one, very quickly uh, aligns to the master as soon as the uh, that form of coupling uh, has been introduced. So while the dynamics is chaotic, these two coupled systems show identical dynamics. Uh, one can even show that uh, the distance between orbits decreases exponentially, rather, and although there, there is sensitivity to initial condition. 
Now, one of the things that I'd like to suggest is that we can see this process of synchronization as a control method. Uh, you've got the master equations on the left, the slave equations on the right, and the master controls the slave in the following way. Uh, rewriting the slave equations uh, more suggestively, uh, where you put in two extra terms. Uh, you see, the effect of these two extra terms, uh, The unfortunately, I'm not able to uh, move a uh, move any kind of a cursor onto the screen, at least I'm not sure that I can. Um, maybe I can, just a second. Let me. All right, well, these two extra terms that have been added to the, uh, the primed Lorenz equations effectively wipe out the, uh, wipe out the, you know, the X prime from the second and third equations and give us the slave equations that you see uh, at the extreme right of the screen. So one can see, one can take these terms that have been added on as control terms that the that have that have been introduced into the system, so that we have uh, uh, so that so that one has a uh, master slave. You see, you control the slave in a way such that it forgets its own variables and takes on those of the uh, master. Let me just take one moment off to try to acquire a an arrow which does not seem to be happening. All right. Okay. Uh, there are other forms of synchrony that are known, and uh, many of these have been described at great length uh, in the wonderful book by Jürgen and his uh, colleagues. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, Rosenblum, Pikowski, and Kurtz uh, discovered uh, or in, in introduced uh, the idea of phase synchronization when they were studying the, the Rossler oscillator. When you couple two Rossler oscillators, uh, with uh, a simple diffusive coupling, it turns out that uh, the oscillations, they are in phase, but uncorrelated in amplitude. So if you looked at the phase of the oscillations, you would find that as you increase the coupling, the phase difference actually goes to zero, uh, whereas the amplitudes remain uncorrelated in time. Uh, in general, one way of checking for this kind of correlation or lack of correlation is to plot one variable versus the other. Uh, and this is useful when you look at uh, examples of, uh, let's say, asynchronous motion. And when things are asynchronous, you find that uh, you just get a mess on the, on the plane. Uh, in uh, the, the graph in C shows an example of phase synchronization where the phases are very highly correlated. Uh, and that gives a plot which has got some kind of a, I mean, it's, it's not an unholy mess like the plot in B, but it has got some kind of structure. And complete synchronization leads to this diagonal line on, uh, on the plane, uh, as was shown in uh, the figure F. This is taken from uh, the book by Pikowski, Rosenblum, and Kurtz. So the simplest way of, of figuring out the correlation between systems is to plot one versus the other. Of course, this can be made more quantitative, but I just want to give a visual uh, impression here. Uh, if X and Y were exactly equal to one another, if they were synchronized, let's say, then the points would fall on the diagonal line. And this diagonal line is a subspace of this entire space. In fact, it is a submanifold. And in the context of synchrony, this is called the synchronization manifold. So when you take two Lorenz oscillators and couple them, uh, and if you just couple them with simple diffusive coupling, uh, for sufficiently large uh, epsilon, uh, the systems will synchronize, namely they'll move in unison. 
And if you plot the variables of one versus the variables of the other, uh, in purple, you see over here when it's unsing, uncoupled, they're just uncorrelated. But the moment you couple them, they get synchronized and they fall on that diagonal line, which is a subspace. Uh, even when you couple them and they are not synchronized, again, you have this red mess, uh, but when they synchronize, again, they are on this, uh, they, they are on a, this lower dimensional submanifold. So uh, there are many ways of synchronizing stuff as we've seen already in these two examples, uh, you've got a master and a slave that can drive, uh, one can drive the other. You can couple both of these uh, just as we have shown in this last example. And finally, one can also have the situation where both systems are driven or coupled to a third. But there, there are several variations, but a framework that includes all these cases is that of generalized synchronization. Now, I want to just assert that uh, synchronization in coupled dynamical systems implies in some sense that there is a map between the variables of the two systems that relate the dynamics of one to the other. Uh, this resulting dynamics occurs on a lower dimensional invariant submanifold of the phase space, namely the synchronization manifold. Now this functional phi that is indicated here in uh, on, on the right of the screen, uh, that y of t, that is the variable y, is some functional. Uh, th this functional can actually be quite complicated. So uh, in general, the synchronization manifold, which is an invariant subspace, if there is stable synchronization, it has lower dimension than the phase space. Uh, in fact, it can be much lower. For the synchronization to be stable, this manifold should also be transversally stable, namely that if you perturb away from this manifold, you should get back to it. Uh, this is, as we saw in the example of the Lorenz oscillator, uh, even though along the manifold you are unstable, away from the manifold you are transversally stable. Okay, uh, this, uh, this is the property of what's called K-hyperbolicity. This mapping between these two systems, phi, need not be smooth. In some cases, it may not even be differentiable. Uh, and this is actually a strong requirement uh, that uh, one, one says that generalized synchronization is, synchronization is strong generalized synchronization when this manifold is rather smooth. Okay. The point of view that I'm taking is that any coupling that brings the dynamics to a lower dimensional subspace is some form of synchrony. Whether if it is uh, identical synchronization, then this submanifold is really the diagonal line, so to speak. But it could be uh, something which is not quite as I will show in some of the examples that we are coming to. So the general strategy is really uh, uh, that we have a submanifold in the phase space, and this submanifold um, uh, it is some arbitrary uh, surface. And what we would like to do is to take the motion and bring it onto this submanifold. So, in general, if you take two coupled dynamical systems, you can generalize this to more than two. If you take two dynamical systems, which are coupled, which have the flow equations, uh, x dot is f of x and y dot is f of y, you couple them in the, in the way shown, generalized synchrony is the condition that for some coupling, the variables of the two have a functional dependence. I'm just saying the same thing over again, all right? If one of these is zero, for example, if zeta x is zero, then, the variables of the drive of X are unaffected by Y and you effectively have a master-slave situation. In the most general scenario, the drive and the response systems need not be identical or even similar. Then if they are similar, then the function phi could be the identity that is, you could have, uh, you, you could have perfect synchronization, all right? So uh, 
what we've seen is that if you take two systems and you couple them somehow, you get synchrony once the systems are there and the coupling is specified. The question that we asked ourselves some years ago was that can one reverse engineer this process? Namely, specify the functional relation and then deduce the coupling. You see, in the normal way, you're given f of x, you're given zeta of x, you're given f of y, given zeta of y, and what results is phi. What we would like to do is to go in the reverse direction. So say the functional relationship is given as phi of x is equal to zero, where uh, phi is just the set of conditions. All right, x, x is, the, I mean, these are all the variables. It's the same, the notation is slightly changed over here. All right. Now, once I have got that this is my required uh, condition, can I deduce a coupling that will achieve this target? And we proceed as follows. The surface represents the desired synchronization manifold M of phi. The points, uh, you know, the system is at some arbitrary point X sub B. And um, on this manifold, I've got a point X naught and X A. So the idea is, how do I get the coupling so that nearby trajectories from X B or any similar set of, you know, some neighborhood of that can be brought onto the sub manifold. And then I want to assure that the motion stays on this sub manifold, namely, I'd like to constrain it to the surface. Now, in order that the submanifold specified by phi x y is equal to zero is to be invariant, a trajectory that is on this manifold should remain on it. So we require that the flow direction be orthogonal to the normal vectors at any point x on phi. The normals are given by n sub i, and you know there are these i directions phi one, phi two, phi three. These are all the constraint equations. So these will define for you a set of normals. So we make a vector of normals and you'd like them to, uh, we'd like the flow to be orthogonal to this vector of normals. Namely, we'd like n times f of x to be equal to zero. Now, actually the flow is not just the flow itself. It also includes the uh, coupling. So what we really want is n times f plus zeta of x is zero. And therefore you get this identity that n times zeta of x is minus n times the normals of x. Now this set of equations gives actually many, many solutions uh, because it is uh, underdetermined. So by, while this, you know, because these uh, matrices n, these are not square matrices and they don't all have unique solutions. So you can actually find a variety of solutions. And uh, when we note that while this coupling is guaranteed to bring the trajectory onto the manifold, the coupling is only defined up to a additional functions that will vanish on the synchronization manifold. So you can add any number of terms that will vanish on M of phi, All right? So, uh, you know, so the last step in our construction, and this is described in our paper in FizRev E, uh, the last step in the construction is to require that the Jacobian along at all these points on the submanifold, we'd like the eigenvalues of the Jacobian to be negative. And then you can get stability. Uh, it may be it may be necessary to add essentially Lyapunov functions uh, such that the manifold can be made transversely stable. But in the examples that we have studied, it's not particularly difficult to do so. All right. So let let me show you how this works. All right. Uh, if you have two Lorentz oscillators and ask. Uh, so one is described by the variables x, the other is described by the variables y. And we'd like to know what form of coupling will scale the variables in the following manner. Namely, uh, we'd like x1 to be a times y1, x2 to be y, b times y2, and x3 to be c times y3. 
right? Uh, uh, experts will recognize this as a form of projective synchronization. But the question is, can you couple two Lorentz systems so that the submanifold in question is not the usual synchronization, identical synchronization submanifold, uh, but something which is tilted? It's just a linear transformation, but can we make it tilted? It turns out actually that you know the methodology that uh, I've just described can be carried out quite easily. And uh, what you see on the left is an image, uh, the green uh, Lorenz attractor, uh, or I should say actually properly, the green Lorenz-like attractor uh, is, uh, is a, it's a projection of the black one. And uh, both of these have got slight modifications because the coupling is bidirectional and, the, and uh, they affect each other uh, equally in, a, in some sense. Uh, but one of them is blown up. The factor of A is one, B is two, and C is three. So you can see that there has been a, a stretching in the X, Y, and Z directions uh, quite effectively. Right. And uh, the methodology that I have described gives us these coupling terms. So this, uh, this is globally stable for any values of A, B, and C. Uh, and so one can actually do this quite nicely in an electronic uh, experiment. Uh, one can make these circuits because the Lorenz system has uh, is very conveniently uh, simulatable uh, and, and you know, uh, an analog simulation is easy. Uh, and that's what that is. But now we've introduced also these additional coupling terms uh, that you see here written as zeta one and zeta two. These are the additional coupling terms that are added to the equations for, X, uh, for the, uh, the two different Lorentz oscillators. And, uh, and here, are the, here are some results where what we've done is to just to choose some values of A, B, and C. And uh, you can see that the, uh, that the, 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 the oscillations uh, of the two systems are identical uh, and they are just scaled by some multiplication factor. Right. Uh, in, there are any number of such linear tricks that one can play, but one thing which is of interest is to have a nonlinear relationship between the two variables. So the uh, the one constraint that we, uh, or rather this is again a three constraint system. We'd like x1 to be equal to y1, x2 to be equal to y2, but x3 squared to be equal to y3. And uh, what, uh, what, what is easy to do therefore is to again figure out what is the nature of the submanifold, the normals and so on. And uh, we go ahead and do this. Um, okay, so when we can choose to make it unidirectional with master and master x and slave y. So uh, once you do that, you can see uh, how the uh, the green oscillator is exactly the same as the black one, except that the z variable has been squared. So everything is just multiplied by uh, the appropriate factor there. Okay. Uh, if you now plot x3 versus y3, one can see the, the, the nature of this curved submanifold onto which the dynamics has been driven. And uh, because the uh, coupling has been chosen to be uh, zero for the case for the uh, x Lorentz system, but non-zero for the Y system, you can see it's a master-slave situation. Uh, so it's actually exactly the Lorentz and exactly the, you know, the, the second one is the square uh, of the Z variable of the Lorentz. Right? Now, of course, this can be done in two ways. One is to ask X3 squared to be Y3, uh, or you can ask for X3 to be the square root of Y3. Uh, and that can also be done now to have it uh, have the Y system as the master and the X subsystem as the slave that gives us another coupling. Uh, and you can see the terms over there, uh, they're not as pretty or not as simple as the other case, but uh, that form of the coupling gives us the blue uh, Lorenz attractor, which you can see is also on this curved submanifold. 
And uh, finally, we can even have a bidirectional coupling, which is the, the last ones written over there. Again, it's not very pretty, uh, and it's not as easy to do these experiments because you have these variables appearing in the denominator. But you see, uh, that gives the red, um, the red Lorenz attractor. All three of these forms lead to the same objective, Namely, this dynamics is confined to a desired submanifold in the phase space. So this methodology that we've outlined uh, actually gives a, a, a very strong, you know, so I just summarize this over here. This is a very powerful one. So long as you can define these derivatives, et cetera, so that, you know, we need the submanifold to have some good you know, mathematically good properties. Okay. Now, in the last few years, what we've been thinking about is that can we extend this to spatial degrees of freedom as well? Instead of uh, wanting to constrain one variable to be the square of the other or whichever way all these things goes, uh, what happens if you demand a spatial separation? Uh, and the inspiration for this came from, uh, you know, looking at bird flocks. I've already shown the picture of the murmurations. And uh, when you look at bird flocks, you see again here a few hundred thousand birds. Uh, when you do the time lapse photography uh, of them, you find that uh, the way in which these birds are able to keep their um, you know, to keep from colliding with each other is really through some very tricky uh, manipulations, but you can see that there is a certain kind of synchronization that's going on uh, because uh, you, you need to avoid uh, travel at similar speeds, if not exactly the same speed, and uh, avoid hitting each other and so on. So it requires a certain kind of spatio-temporal organization right, um, in, in this system. So uh, let, let me just come back to this idea of generalized synchronization and say that if you have this condition that x dot is f of x plus zeta of x uh, and y dot is f of y plus zeta of y, and the rela desired relationship is phi of x minus y is equal to zero, there is a very simple way of, of achieving this. If we choose zeta of x to be zero and zeta of y uh, to be this quantity that you see on the, you know, uh, in the middle of your screen, uh, effectively what happens is that your resulting equations are uh, that x dot is f of x and y dot is just this constraint or this requirement that you had phi x minus y plus the Jacobian times f of x. Now, in most cases, of course, this will give you the right result because d by dt of phi x minus y is just some constant of phi x minus y. And uh, that will decay exponentially to zero. Uh, and it will not quite be within the framework of synchronization because effectively the old system has been completely destroyed and you've just got some new, uh, some new dynamics which will bring you to the manifold. Nevertheless, this is very useful if the constraint is linear. Namely, if phi of x is just x plus c, then notice that x dot is equal to f of x and y dot becomes f of x plus this, this constraint or this limitation. Because, uh, because phi of x is just linear, so the Jacobian of that is just one, right? When this happens, it doesn't matter that the, uh, you know, that the original, uh, sort of original dynamics, whatever that was for y has gone because now you've got a way of maintaining two systems at exactly the separation C. So what happens is that the velocity functions become identical and the slave Y takes on the master's velocity and maintains a separation C, which is the constraint. 
I should point out that after we did this derivation and found it, this was actually, you know, a comment was made by Job's Hepzig at uh, Potsdam, uh, which uh, sort of made me think a little along these lines. But then once we got this, we found that uh, airlines uh, use this somewhere in some form or the other uh, as a way of avoiding collisions in, uh, in the sky by constraining systems to uh, fly with the same velocity but uh, and, uh, and fixed separations. Uh, so this is, a, this is actually a patented as a, or some version of this has been patented uh, as, a, uh, as something for convoys to avoid collisions. So if we now think of X and Y as spatial coordinates, uh, can one spatially uh, synchronize two Van der Poel oscillators, let's say, uh, to have a separation A and B in the X and Y direction. And uh, chugging through with our methodology, boom, again, you can do this. It's quite easy to uh, make these two Van der Poel oscillators uh, separated at distances A and B from one another quite, quite nicely. Right. Uh, but you can actually do more. You can have an arbitrary flock uh, of uh, birds or you know, objects that are flying in the sky uh, and keeping the same constraints all over, uh, you find, for example, that uh, you have, you, you can take an arbitrary trajectory so that the velocity doesn't even have to be a well-defined function you can still get this kind of spatio-temporal organization, uh, which we'd like to call spatio-temporal synchrony, uh, quite easily using functions like this. Now, finally, uh, we did actually uh, try to apply this to uh, the control of drones, of autonomous uh, air, of, you know, un unmanned aircraft. You can see three of them on the screen over here. And uh, well, using this particular algorithm, uh, it's possible to make these all move together in space as well as in time. Uh, given the perspective, it's not always easy to see that, uh, that they are in this kind of synchrony, but in whatever measurements we've made, uh, to a very high degree of accuracy, the, uh, these uh, drones maintain a constant distance, except for that interloper on the screen uh, who seems to be traveling at his own velocity. But these other three drones, uh, which were programmed to stay a fixed distance from one another, uh, did actually manage to, uh, to maintain this uh, kind of constraint. Okay. So to summarize, um, the synchrony is one of the most visible effects of coupling between systems. It's a very general means through which spatio and temporal organization arises in complex systems. Uh, there are many different forms of synchrony and a simple unifying framework is provided by the idea of a synchronization manifold. Um, it's possible to design a proper coupling function for almost any desired differentiable functional dependence between the drive and the response. Uh, the almost is because uh, it would be foolish to try to say that you can do any of these uh, things regardless of how complex uh, the, depend the relationship is. Uh, also because these equations get to be messy uh, and we've done some of the simplest examples of nonlinear systems. Uh, now, we've known for a long time that synchronization is not a unique problem. Many forms of coupling give the same objective. They'll reach the synchronization manifold. We'd like to think of this as offering a high level of control. All right. Now, synchronization emerges as a phase transition, but more importantly for this talk, synchronization is a constraint. Uh, and this is a constraint that, like other constraints in other mechanical systems, reduces the dimensionality of the collective motion. 
Uh, a wide variety of systems can show synchrony, linear, nonlinear, weak, strong coupling, chaotic, regular dynamics, and uh, even with noise. And so many of these ideas are relevant and basic as well as in applied areas. Uh, and with that, I'd like to acknowledge uh, the work of Shahrukh Chishti, Amrita Punabajala, Vishal Janeja, uh, Suresh Kumaraswamy, uh, and especially the Bot Lab at IIT Delhi, which uh, who who are daring enough to use their drones with some of our algorithms, at least for a few of these experiments. And with that, let me thank you for your attention. Thank you, Ram, for this very nice talk. So there are some questions in the Q&A box. Uh, would you like to see them yourself or should I read it out? They seem okay. to be general questions. Sure. Yeah. So it's in the Q&A box. The four uh, just, yeah. Would you somehow make me stop sharing? Uh... Yeah, I think you have stopped, actually. Okay. All right. Okay, so uh, I think the first is about um, facelift bifurcation. Can you read? See the questions? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, I have the, what is the cause of phenomenon of synchronization? Uh, what is the cause of this phenomenon of synchronization in nature? I understand that coupling is a prerequisite for synchrony. It, nonetheless, indeed, it is not a reason for this phenomenon. Can we provide some causes of this phenomenon instead of saying it's the natural process? Okay. Uh, the way in which I would say, at least within the context of my talk over here, is to say that, uh, it, of course, the coupling is a prerequisite for the synchrony, but if the coupling is such that it brings the motion to a lower dimensional manifold, uh, a sub-manifold, then you automatically have, uh, have a form of synchrony. In case uh, you don't, I mean, you can couple and still not get into a sub-manifold. In case you are not on that sub-manifold, I suppose you would not call that synchronization, even though you are coupled. Uh, so, uh, Anupam, uh, you know, what I, I think one has to go with is that uh, the reason for synchronization really is the stability of the sub-manifold. If one doesn't have that, one will not get uh, synchronization. Um, yeah? yeah? Thank you. There are some five questions about it, actually. Yeah, yeah. I'm just coming to that. I, uh, there's a question from Gustavo Martinez, uh, and um, I, yes, I, I, I think, you see, I have played around with mappings. Uh, I haven't played around with couple map lattices, uh, so I'm pretty sure that it can be done, Gustavo. Um, and yeah, I mean, it would be nice. I mean, if you're interested, please do go ahead and uh, let me know what you get. Uh, of course, you get, uh, you know, in the simplest cases of one or two uh, maps, uh, you, you can get synchronization, but this reverse process of designing is not something that I've seen people uh, try to do. Uh, Ramesh uh, says, once the synchronization is established, how difficult or easy is it to bring desynchrony into the system? It's very easy to bring desynchrony, uh, Ramesh. Uh, one, as I pointed out, once you are synchronized, you're on the submanifold. Uh, anything that destabilizes the submanifold will take you away from it. So you need to make it transversally unstable, right? Um, if we have a system that has two coupled oscillators, is there a way to identify which one of them is a master or a slave? What we call uh, master-slave dynamics is really what's called the skew product. So if the dynamics of one system is not affected by the other, the system which is not affected is the master. The dynamics of the system that is affected by the other is the slave. So if the X dynamics is unaffected by Y, that's the master, and the Y dynamics is affected by X, it's the slave. 
Can we quantify strongly and weakly coupled synchronization? If yes, what are the measures available? Uh, this is a qualitative question, Biraya, uh, meaning that, you know, what is not always, not what is uh, weak for some is strong for others. Uh, it has to do with the scale of interactions, I suppose. All right. So if you find that the, uh, that the coupling term is of much smaller overall magnitude compared to the other motions in the systems, then one would call it weak. Otherwise, one would call such a thing strong. All right. And um, uh, what are symmetric and asymmetric synchronizations? There's a, there's a, not exactly sure what you mean, Somnath. Uh, if it is a particular form of synchronization, uh, I, I, I'm really not clear. If what you mean is that, uh, you know, in the examples that I showed where the constants A, B, and C have got uh, different values, uh, and that is a asymmetric synchronization. Uh, if that's what you meant, then I've got an answer, but otherwise um, I'm not, I'm really not clear. So you can, you know, perhaps phrase it again. You can say that this is about uh, do you think this is about uh, phase flip bifurcation, the transition from um, symmetric to unsymmetric? No, I don't think it is. Um, I mean, Sumnath, you could just please expand your question if you like. Yeah, I guess the panelists also can ask questions. Yeah, Ram, it has been a very beautiful lecture, very clear. Thank you. Uh, so you say that the coupling is not unique to, to reach a synchronization manifold. Yeah. So will there be then relationship between, say, if you have two possible couplings which lead to the same synchronization manifold, mm -hmm. so will there be interrelationship between those two systems? Not really, because the, as I said, you know, the set of equations is underdetermined. So you can have many, many solutions that satisfy it. Even take the simplest example, which is uh, identical synchronization. Uh, for the pecora carroll method, so to speak, you have, uh, you know, you have the master-slave coupling, which I showed, uh, you know, has this other algebraic structure. Uh, the diffusive coupling is just x1 minus x2. Yes. And there is almost no relation between the diffusive coupling and this, these complicated terms that go into pecora carroll Okay. Yeah. So, you know, what we found in general is that, uh, you know... There is uh, no relationship. Yeah, there is there's no clear relationship. And uh, this example of this quadratic uh, constraint, you know, that... Um, uh, the uh, the third variable x3 is the square is equal to y3 what what we see is or what i would assert is that the manifold may be the same different couplings may take you to different parts of the manifold now considering uh, uh, these couplings i mean as differential equations so ultimately you are getting a I mean, specific solution, stable solution. Yeah. So in that sense, I would expect some connections between these two, I mean, different systems. For the, uh, okay, let me just, say that, let, me, let me think a little more about it. But, uh, you know, on the face of it, I would say that there need be no connection between the two, even just going on some simple uh, sort of anecdotal examples here. Okay, okay. Ambika, you have some questions? Yeah, Ram, very nice talk. Thank you, Ram. I think I am hearing it a second time or something, but still I enjoy <laughs> it. must be the nth time you are hearing it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, one or two clarifications. In the very beginning, you mentioned about spatial synchronization. Uh -huh. What do you mean? What can be a measure for quantifying spatial synchronization? What do you think? How See, do we say that two okay. systems are spatially synchronized? All right. And well, okay. What I did not present uh, was some results where, uh, if if I want, uh, you know, okay, if I think of the x, y, and z variables in even in Lorentz as a, a spatial variables, 
in three dimensional space. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Usually you want the, uh, by spatial synchronization, I'm mostly interested in situations where the X variable is at a distance, you know, the separation between two X variables is something, two Y variables is something and two Z variables okay. is something else, right? Uh, nevertheless, our, the methodology that we have is able to include uh, time dependent constraints. So I can have, for example, that the X variables uh, change, let's say oscillate in time, all right? So this, this can give rise to, uh, you know, in, in terms of the manifold, uh, manifold is some simple, simple thing, uh, but, you know, but you can have the, the manifold itself varying in time. So the, uh, the sort of the synchronized, there's no measure in, in, in the space, it's just a question mm -hmm. of the distance between the two points, right? Mm -hmm. So that's what you want. Okay, so in the towards the end, you talked about two systems going with the same distance between them. Will you call it spatial synchrony? This is what I call spatial synchronized because I mean, when you take these large flocks of birds or fish yeah. or what have you, mm -hmm. I mean, if they are not synchronized to keep, uh, you know, mm -hmm. I mean, I'm just extending the word synchrony to show that it is the same amount, you know, it's following the same paths in space time. Okay, and also one more thing. You talk about talked about the, uh, I mean, at least in the context of master slave, is it possible that by choosing a pro appropriate function as you have defined, mm. can even make it a totally different dynamics? The examples you showed, at least the system yeah. shows some sort of Lorentz behavior there oh, left. See, the, not, that, you know, that you can you can do you, you put your you make know, it a totally it, different dynamics. Yeah. That you change your, if you make a constraint which actually is just difficult to satisfy, you'll satisfy the constraint, but you'll kill the system. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. This this happens with many, many choices of. Yeah, uh, yeah. But in the very early days, that was not our concept of synchronization. <laughs> no, I don't, I, I don't even call that synchronization yeah. over here. All right. I'm just saying that, you know, that's why when I presented this direct approach right at the end. I don't use it for anything except for the case where phi of x is linear. Yeah, yeah. Because then that's the Jacobian it. is one. Yeah, yeah. Mm, okay, that's it. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Okay. Uh, there are some, uh, uh, some more questions. Two questions in the Q&A box. Okay. Uh, can you see them? Um, is there any uh, real world example for master slave framework? Uh, Abhishek, uh, yeah, I mean, there are uh, many uh, examples of uh, master slave uh, framework, uh, especially when, you know, I mean, thinking biologically, uh, for example, uh, if you've got a drive which is extremely strong. Uh, then you find that the slaves uh, will have to adapt to the master, so to speak. Um, you know, I mean, the circadian rhythm is a great example. Like all of us get up in the morning and go to sleep at night by and large. Uh, and this is a way in which we've all synchronized to the uh, periodicity of the sun. So that really is a master. And we are, you know, at least this kind of dynamics gets, uh, becomes a response. So it's a drive response system. Um, there are many other examples that one, one can have, uh, but I would just say that any system, any two systems that are coupled with one of them not being affected by the other gives you an example of master-slave. And there are specific examples that you can uh, pick up. Uh, okay, uh, are there any early warnings before synchronization begins? Uh, it turns out that there are actually, uh, because, you know, coming onto the synchronization manifold uh, does uh, require that the dynamics be directed towards it. But warnings, I wouldn't say, I mean, it, this is not a disaster, so it's, we don't want warnings particularly. Uh, but you can, you can track the process of synchronization by all sorts of measures. Uh, some of them are like distances, some of them are like to do with phases and so on. So it is possible to assess when you will get synchronized. 
And Shubham, uh, can we have a bound on the coupling term? Um, you mean to make a distinction between what is strong and weak? Uh, I'm not sure that that's very useful uh, in terms of, um, you know, because it, it's so system dependent. So it's not, it's not easy to come up with these bounds that separate strong and weak, uh, especially, you know, for these kinds of complicated systems. So I, I would say probably no. Uh, in Somnath says, in master-slave synchronization, number of slaves can be multiple. I understand the number of master is one, if I'm not wrong. If, yes, Somnath, you can have a hundred slaves. You can have many, many, many slaves because they're all taking the signal from the master. Uh, it's no, no question you can do that. Do diverse systems, Shiva Kumar says, do diverse systems exhibit universal characteristics at the onset of synchronization? Um, yes, uh, there are many systems for which the transition to synchronization is like a second order phase transition. Uh, so, uh, you know, the most famous example being the Kuromoto model. Uh, so if you would like to look at this onset of synchronization, you'd like to check if you can get an order parameter, uh, then the typical thing to look for is power law behavior. So uh, yes, uh, many diverse systems do show this universal characteristic. And uh, what you should look for is some scaling, scaling behavior, meaning the connection between statistical mechanics and uh, synchronization of large ensembles of systems is very direct. Yeah? OK. Maybe. There's one last question, and maybe with that you can stop. Thank you. Um, <laughs> uh, Ishak says, how do birds, fish, etc., exhibit spatial synchrony? Is there any natural mechanism which are inbuilt? Uh, evolution is a great natural mechanism, Ishak. I, <laughs> I suspect that, uh, you see, these are all you know instinctive behaviors. And uh, as you saw, the actual mechanism that you can work with is very simple. You keep the same speed, uh, you know, you, we know this also with uh, when you go out for a walk with your friends, uh, regardless of whether you are tall or your friend is tall or short or what have you, you find pretty soon that you start, uh, you start walking at the same speed and staying at a certain distance, if not exactly fixed, you know, this, this sort of, uh, it, it, you, you maintain a constant distance from your friend uh, as you walk. This kind of, this is called gait synchrony. That is your, you start walking in step with each other at the same speed and at a fixed distance. Uh, and we do this in order to, I mean, I mean, this is an this is a learned behavior, right? Uh, so I would say that for fish or for birds or what have you, one of the things that they do learn is how to fly at exactly the same speed as your friends, and how to avoid them by maintaining a fixed distance from each other. Uh, it may not be from all of them, but I think that there's uh, some uh, understanding that um, a given bird in a flock. Um, uh, you know, a given bird in a flock will usually uh, look at some six neighbors, uh, six of its neighbors. So if you're going at the same speed as, as all of them uh, and maintaining a fixed distance, then you're definitely not going to collide because for a bird to collide in midair is sort of essentially death, all right? So this would have to be something that comes uh, at, at least in part from uh, evolution. So I, I, I would say that. Uh, in master-slave synchronization, can one become the other? And why not, Abhishek? Uh, I mean, if you have the, the coupling changes, you know, you can have time-dependent couplings and one can do it. It depends on why, if you want to engineer a system, uh, that's a possibility. 
but in a natural system, I'm not sure that that would quite happen. And Tanushri is asking whether uh, uh, whether uh, it's possible to have two masters controlling one slave. The poor slave's life will be miserable, <laughs> Tanushri. Uh, no, uh, and this usually gives rise to frustration. And I don't mean the normal kind of frustration, mathematical frustration, because you know, you're getting two signals from two competing signals. Um, and you will probably not be able to obey either the master dynamics of, of either of the masters. So uh, I would say that two masters controlling one slave, it's an interesting idea, but, um, but it, it would not result in the slave mimicking, I mean, which master is it to follow? So it, it would have the usual problem. All right, okay, Somnath's last question. In complex systems, can we think about bidirectional coupling between two variables at one time? Though influence can come from a third variable. I don't know, Somnath, this is a very specific kind of question that probably needs a specific answer by looking at, uh, you know, the equations uh, in, you know, the equations that you have. So let's leave it for another day. Okay. I think uh, otherwise we are done with the questions. Yeah. Uh, so let's, uh, I, I think you, the audience made you give a tutorial on synchronization, looks like got all their questions about everything answered. So thank you so much for- uh, My for pleasure, Sujit. And it's lovely seeing you and, and uh, Lakshmanan and Ambika. Yes. Okay. On that happy note, good night, good morning, good afternoon, whatever it is. Okay, cheers. Good night. Bye. Okay, good. Thank you. Bye bye. Much. Thank you. Yeah. So the um, the next one will be on March twenty seven by Hendrik Jensen. Yeah. Okay. He's from Imperial College London, and you speak on informa information theoretic characterization of emergent behavior. Thank you. Good. Okay, thank you, Sujit. Bye. Yeah.